with Jeff Metcalf of the Arizona Republic, followed by Alex Simon. I want to say hi to Jeff Metcalf. Hi, hello again. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. We talked about this a little bit before on the phone, but um, these Pride Night celebrations and just the, the progress the league has made in sort of finding a way to um, embrace all of its fans, you know, no matter what persuasion they come from, how important has that been toward just the league moving forward and, and finding, its, finding its niche, I guess? Well, I think you can definitely say that this league is uh, hands uh, in that effort, right? I, uh, we look around the various professional sports leagues and, and nobody has, uh, has really taken uh, such proactive steps as the W uh, in doing this. And I, I think it's really important. We have such a wonderful platform. We have such popular athletes that, you know, to use that celebrity uh, to wrap your arms around the fans. And uh, really for me, the message is always like, everyone's welcome here. And, uh, I'm, you know, we're seeing some, those seeds that the W has planted sprouting in other leagues as well. I was uh, at the Giants, San Francisco Giants game last uh, Saturday when they uh, unveiled for the first time a Major League Baseball team with a, a pride uh, colored logo on both their hat and their uniforms. That was the very first for Major League Baseball, um, you look around all of our leagues and you see what uh, various teams have chosen to do. And I, I, you know, I think the cumulative effect of that is, is really significant uh, uh, and, and should not ever be underestimated. Also, um, when you think back about the uh, early Mercury years, um, whether you're at the league or here, are there are there certain things that stand out about those early years to you? Maybe the years before Diana. Wow, was there a time before Diana? I guess there was, right? Uh, well, this was always the franchise that uh, uh, the league was so thrilled right from the beginning, right? Derek Langelo had no hesitation in becoming one of the charter teams uh, in the WNBA and was completely supportive uh, from day one. Uh, you know, I, I think. Again, right from the beginning, this was a market that really embraced the W. It was one of our points of pride always uh, when we talked about the league and, and all the success stories that we were having. Um, you know, for me personally, it was the you know 2007 championship, that very first championship. Uh, you know, I was here and uh, got to experience it myself, and you know, it was just such uh, a magical season from beginning to end, and and uh, certainly one I'm never going to forget. All right, next up, we have Alex Simon with the next. Hi, Rick. Alex Simon from the next. It's nice to meet you virtually through the yeah. screen here. Yeah. Um, it's been 10 years since you came out publicly. To be back here in Phoenix for a Pride Night where you're the speaker, just personally for you, what is, what is this moment like for you? Yeah, it was interesting. I, I got a great tour of this amazing new arena today, which I'm just uh, blown away by. And you know, I, I still can find my way around, even though there's a lot of new spaces and a lot of different spaces and we're here when I was here. Um, you know, I'd say I've, I've reflected a little bit on, on how I came back to Phoenix after that. I actually, when that story broke, I was in New York City. Uh, only a couple people here in Phoenix knew that that was happening at the time it did, a front page story in the New York Times. Uh, and I remember very, very distinctly parking in the parking garage the first day back and taking that walk from my car to the front door of our offices and just realizing that, you know, everything had changed, you know, everything in my life had changed over the course of a very short period of time and, and a little few butterflies, right, walking into the office for the first time and greeting Ciola at the front desk and then uh, walking through the offices and getting the kind of hugs and congratulations from the people that I worked with. It was a big deal to me. And to be back here 10 years later, uh, reflect a lot about the journey since, uh, which has been amazing for me. Uh, obviously, professionally, it was a different franchise where we enjoyed a lot of success, but so many amazing things have come my way in the last 10 years. I will say, you know, to put a stake in the ground, I think the WNBA still, uh, and women's sports in general, still way ahead of where our men's professional leagues are uh, and where society is, frankly, in LGBTQ rights. Uh, 
And I think that was amplified uh, during the bubble last year where, where I think the W players were uh, really looked at as worldwide leaders in, in really important social justice causes. And that makes me really proud. Um, I think, you know, you can see this league that's now 25 years old uh, that has matured in a way that I think everybody who was there at the beginning uh, is incredibly proud. And speaking of actually, you know, this arena is brand new. I know you were instrumental in that new Chase Center. I'm actually a Bay Area native. I've been there. It's an absolutely gorgeous facility. So congratulations on that. I'm curious from your perspective, how viable is the Bay Area as a potential WNBA expansion market? I think it's the best possible market uh, that the W currently isn't, right? So we, you know, we're, we, we took a couple of runs quietly uh, at teams during my, uh, my tenures at the Warriors, a couple of teams that had chosen to move. Uh, one, you know, it didn't work out and the other one, the timing just wasn't right. So we, we've really studied the WNBA. We, we know how it works. We understand the economics. We've, we've studied how it would work in the Bay Area. And I, I'm incredibly bullish. I, you know, certainly the commissioner and I have talked about that, uh, Kathy Engelbert, and, you know, I think it would be great for the league. Great history of women's basketball, uh, especially right now, the reigning national champions uh, uh, at Stanford uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, I don't know if you know that the uh, primary owner of the Warriors, Joe Lacob, was the largest investor and owner of the San Jose uh, franchise in the from the ABL. previous league. Yep. Yeah, in the ABL before the WNBA came into existence. So I think between him, between me, and others in the organization, it's it's very much on the radar screen. We, uh, you know, why not yet? Uh, we had a gigantic seven-year effort to try to uh, build a world-class facility in downtown San Francisco, which. We got done, completely privately financed, but uh, to do a project that complicated uh, in a city that doesn't really embrace development uh, was a, a very heavy lift. And until we got that done, I think uh, it really couldn't be on our agenda. And then, I don't know no, who told you, but nobody told us about the pandemic. Uh, so we also had to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, our building's actually been closed longer than it's been open. Uh, and, you know, we now can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We now can see some normalcy. We're looking forward to a great WNBA season to kind of see where the league goes this year and, and obviously get back to a normal NBA season in the fall. So I, I, I'm really hopeful that the stars will align sometime soon, but I, I really do think the Bay Area, for all the reasons the Warriors have been successful, I really do think the Bay Area is a perfect market for the WNBA uh, at some point in the not too distant future. My mom actually works in Bay Area construction, and I know basically you it takes many hoops to jump through even putting a little awning onto any building to an extent. I guess, you know, in your sense, is it maybe at this point, now that Chase Center is done, is it more of a when question instead of an if question? Is that a fair way to put it? Well, but I, but I don't think you can say everything's back to normal. Um, you know, our NBA, for us as an NBA team, we lost hundreds of millions of dollars this year. Uh, and we need to get back to an economic model that, that, that supports our business. We don't have that yet. Uh, we're very hopeful we're gonna have that next year. So, you know, there's still, there's still some, some residual damage we have to recover from, I think, as an organization before, uh, you know, we're gonna take on any big new projects. And, and I can tell you this about the Warriors, if this happens, uh, it will be done in a way that the WNBA is really proud of, in a way that can guarantee it's going to be really successful with all the resources it needs. But, uh, but we're, not, we're not there yet. All right, we have time for one final question here. That will come from Takeshi Shibata uh, out of Tokyo, Japan. Hello, Rick. Thank you for, so much Hello. for your time. I'm calling from Tokyo, Japan. And... Uh, I know you are kind of involved with the Japanese basketball market. Uh, as a when you worked for the Phoenix Suns, you had Yuta what uh, Yuta Tabuse, the first Japanese player in the NBA's history, and also you have made a uh, involved with a mega uh, contract with the Rakuten uh, when you worked for the Warriors. So, how do you view? The, the potential and uh, the, 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 of the Japanese market and 
do you have any uh, plan or talk about uh, uh, maybe doing some something like a WNBA Jap Jap Japan Games uh, in the in the future with a, a commissioner? Uh, well, nice to meet you. I am a gigantic fan of Japan. Uh, each of the last three years, not not this past year, uh, I've been able to spend a lot of time in Tokyo because, as you said, with our uh, relationship with Rakuten. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a relationship that's grown uh, tremendously over the years and one that we have invested a lot of time and energy in. And, and we, uh, the, as you know, Rakuten also is a rights holder of the NBAs uh, in Japan as it comes to certain broadcast rights. Uh, we've expressed, you know, the interest as the Golden State Warriors to the commissioner that we would, we would love uh, when international games uh, are back on the NBA agenda uh, which won't be this coming season, but will be the following season. Uh, we think it's time to go back to Japan. We would, we, if the league chooses to do that, we would love to be part of that because I think for the NBA, uh, Japan remains a, a, a market where we have real potential. We, we feel great about where we are today, uh, but we understand you know, our importance in the Japanese market right now is not uh, at the potential that we think it could be. And with our partner Rakuten, with the NBA's efforts there, uh, with getting you know, a live uh, game there again, I, I think it would really do wonders for uh, charting the course for the future of the NBA uh, in Japan. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thanks for the time, Rick. Thank you. Thanks everybody.